Miami Torah Center hosted at Asia Torah here in Hollywood, Florida. Um, just a couple announcements. We'd like to thank everyone who is with us this evening. We'd like to thank all of our sponsors, our monthly sponsors and our event sponsors. Thank you, everyone. Tonight's class is also going to be for the Refresh Lama for? Yerachmiel. Shraga. Shraga. Fival. Ben. ben. Bela, who needs a lung transplant, so Bezat Hashem, we should all pray for him urgently uh, amongst all other uh, Jews in need of, uh, of Refuah Shlema. Amen v'amen. Just a quick announcement. Anyone who has not yet seen this or have not blown up their phone or their Facebook with this, I'm going to blow it up right here in front of the camera screen. Anyone who wants to join us for Rosh Hashanah and or Yom Kippur, please, uh, the sooner the better that you, that you book, it would be... Uh, beneficial as we're getting a big demand and we want to accommodate everybody um, with their families. So that's the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, shy of three weeks away. Um, last but not least, um, next week we are going to have class here Tuesday night. Prior to that on Monday night at the Hollywood Costa Res um, uh, Beach Resort, we're going to have Steve Eisenberg. Anyone who has not ever heard of or met Steve Eisenberg is in for a tremendous treat. He is one of the New York inspirational icons in the Jewish world, and he recently moved down to Miami, and his first ever speech and lecture down here is going to be hosted at the Miami Torah Center in Hollywood Beach Costa Resort. So hope to be there. Um, please RSVP if possible. It's going to be a well-attended crowd. So we'd like to, for you to join us with you and your family and your friends and come out and hear Steve Eisenberg, Bizrat Hashem. Um, on Thursday, both Gedalia Fenster and myself are going to be in Mexico City giving some inspiration over there. Everyone will be able to tune in online and watch us, Bizrat Hashem. It's a tremendous privilege to, to be able to have our wings spread further than just the Florida or the, or the United States uh, demograph, Bizrat Hashem. Um, one more announcement before we start, and this I'm going to leave anonymous, but this last week we did mention that it was the Zera Shimshon's Haskara, his yard site. And I sent out a message for everyone to light a candle in his memory. I, I got a lot of pictures of, of different people's candle setups. They light them, they send me pictures of them. It's nice, Baruch Hashem, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Um, again, the concept of lighting candles in Judaism is lighting in the merit of the deceased, rather not praying to the deceased. That would be considered idol worship. It's lighting, praying to God in the merit of the deceased. So listen to what someone told me, and we're going to leave it anonymous, but a certain person who has been attending the classes as well as lit and prayed in the memory of the Zer Shimshon, uh, lit the candle, and that same day or weekend spoke to her neighbor who they haven't spoke who they got into I don't know, a little disagreement over uh, two years so they got that which was very very nice um, also for the fact that she lost her dog and the neighbor actually saved the dog and that's how they made up that's pretty nice okay all for all the dog lovers um, and also she had a falling out for over a couple months ago with her father who's 95 years old and Baruch Hashem today received a call from his father and they made up in whatever way that they were able to. So that, by coincidence, who knows, um, we believe in prayer, we believe in divine intervention and ordination. So uh, it could be not, not just the lighting of the candle, but the studying of the Zer Shimshon and our connection to his Torah and to his learning does mean a lot to all of us who are studying it on a regular basis. So when you believe in it, it actually happens. So that is just one live story of many, and that's why I felt it important to share. This week we are studying Parashat Ki Tetze. Ki Tetze is one of the longer Torah portions in our Torah. Anyone who has a chumash, and maybe today would be a nice idea to follow in a chumash, I'm on page 1054. It's not needed to, but it would be definitely helpful if you would follow in the chumash for today's, uh, for today's class. 1054, honing in towards the end of the Torah. Our Torah, in one portion, there's actually many different episodes and topics in this week's Torah portion. However, we're going to hone in on one concept and we're going to really understand it properly. This is a concept that many don't really know. 
and we're going to come up with a very practical application to our lives and specifically to our relationships in our lives. If we would turn to 1054 as I said, the Torah is speaking to us about different marital prohibitions, certain relationships which are prohibited according to the Torah, namely any incest, God forbid, siblings procreating, which is something disgusting, but it's something which is a prohibition. Um, having a relationship either as a married woman or with a married woman, same idea, completely prohibited. And the result of those two concepts or those two bonds is what gives birth to a bastard, to a mamzer. And that, unlike what anyone else would think, like two people who aren't married, that is maybe not the right thing to do, but that does not give the result of a mamzer. The result of a mamzer is when either there's incest or when there is a case of any type of relations with a married woman, obviously not to her husband. Okay? Then the Torah goes on and speaks about four specific nations and how they are or are not to enter the Jewish people. We're going to mention these four. We're going to delve into each and every one. The first one is the people of Ammon. The next is Moab, and they have the same law. And then we have Edom, and then we have Mitzrayim. These are four different nations that the Torah speaks about. And we're going to see they're grouped up into two different categories. The first two, Ammon and Moab, and then the second two, Edom and Mitzrayim. Okay? We're going to get into the reasons for all of them, but listen to what the Torah says. If anyone would turn, we're in verse 4. It says, Lo yavo Ammoni umo'avi bikal Hashem that any person from Ammon or Moab, these two nations, are not able or welcome to come into the community or the congregation of God, the Jewish people. Gam dor asiri lo yavo lahem bikal Hashem adolam. Even the tenth generation is not able to enter the people of Israel. Now, the commentaries explain that this is only male. Any male Ammon or Moab from those nations are not able to come and marry into the Jewish people, meaning they cannot marry a, a Jewish woman. Okay? A, goy, a, a Ammon man or a Moab man cannot come and marry a Jewish woman. Now let's continue. The Torah tells us a reason why. It says, because they did not come forth and offer bread and water when you were leaving the land of Israel. And they went to rent out and they hired Bil'am in order that he should curse us, God forbid, to curse us out. So the first two it goes as follows, any male from Ammon or Moab can never, meaning will accept them as converts even, but they can never marry a Jewish woman. Why? The Torah tells us two reasons. Number one, because they did not come forth with bread and, and water when we were stranded, when we were leaving the land of Egypt, and then we had to wander. We, we, this was before we got the manna and before we got the well of, of water of Miriam. Okay? Then, second reason is because they went out to hire a sorcerer, the famous or the infamous Bil'am, in order to curse the Jewish people. Now let's look at the second group, and this is the group of Edom and Mitzrayim. I'm moving on to verse 8. Never reject an Edomite because he's your brother. We'll explain. And lo titaev mitri ki geraita be'artso. And don't reject an Egyptian because you were a refugee in their very own land. Rather, bani masher yivaledu lahem, the children that are born to them after they've converted. So you have an Egyptian or 
a Edomite who convert to Judaism. It says as follows, Dor shelishi yavo lahem bikal Hashem. The third generation is able to enter the land, enter the Jewish population. So not the person, and not the person's child, but rather the person's grandchild. The convert's grandchild of either a Mitzri or an Edomite is allowed to marry a Jew like anyone else. That's for both men and women. Uh, very good. And that's for both men and women. So those are the two differences. The first group, Amon and Moav, it's only for the males. And it's forever they're never welcome, even if they convert. And the second group of Edom and Mitzrayim, Edom, Edomites and Egyptians, it's for men and for women, but already the third generation they are allowed, meaning the third generation since conversion is already permitted to enter at the Jewish people. Okay? This is the practicalities of the two separates. Now, now we're going to understand why are they separated and what's the difference between the two. So before we move on to that, it's an important note I want to make that ever since King Sancherev, has anyone heard of King Sancherev? He was an Assyrian king from 700 before the Common Era, 700 years before the Common Era. That's a long time ago. Okay? King Sancherev, obviously not Jewish, what he did was he mixed up the whole world, the Talmud says. He took people from every single country, he took a little bit from, he took, he took the people that lived here, and to show his power, to show how he really ruled the majority of the world, what he did was he displaced everybody and causing everybody to be a refugee in an in a unknown country, splitting up families, splitting up communities. And that was his tactic in, in showing and expressing his power and his reign over the world. So he picked up all the people, for argument's sake, that lived in Egypt, and he scattered them all over the area. And he did the same with the people in Syria in Afghanistan, in Babylon, in North Africa, all over. He picked everyone up and he scattered them all over the world. Okay? Based on that, since that happened, the Talmud came to a conclusion that we don't know who is who, and that means people that live in Egypt, they are not necessarily Egyptians, and the people who live in Ammon or from Ammon and from Moab are not literally the original ones, and therefore we say that any convert that comes to join the Jewish population, they are coming from a majority of not being from one of these four, and therefore they are accepted as long as they're coming, meaning, and they have no prohibition of these being one of these four nations. Yes, they have to come and they have to convert 100%, they have to be not converting for marriage, they have to be completely committed, all of these different things. But there's no prohibition of them being one of these four nations because everything was mixed up. The Talmud says that Sancherev bilbel et haolam, he mixed up literally all the people of the world. Very interesting to note. So practically nowadays, when a convert comes, it's not like we check, oh, are you an uh, Edomite? Are you an Egyptian? Are you, are you from Ammon or from Moab? Because none of those are real authentic identities anymore after it was mixed up. Okay? Now the Zer Shimshon, that was just as a mini introduction to the two different groups of prohibited converts that the Torah speaks about. Now the Zer Shimshon asks a very interesting question. He says, it seems like for the first group, there's two reasons why they cannot enter the Jewish population. As it says in verse 5, or in chapter 23 in verse 5, number one, because they didn't come and, they ser and serve you bread and water. And then it says, Va'asher sachar alecha, and also because they went out to rent and to hire, rather, Bil'am, in order to curse you. The Zeshim Shan says, which one is it? Well, is it both? Wasn't one a good enough reason to reject them from coming forever? Why is there a need for both? So he first sheds the light on one opinion, then he disagrees on it. The Nachmanides, the Ramban, says that really each of these reasons, the first reason of not coming out for bread and water, that is ap applicable to Amon, to the first nation. And the second reason that they went to hire Bil'am, that's applicable to the second nation of Moab. Okay? And he proves it, the, the, the Ramban, the Nachmanides, proves it by saying, at the end of the 40 years, you know who came out with food, with bread and water? It was actually Moab. 
Moab came out with bread and water. So that first reason doesn't apply to them. The first reason applies to the first nation. The second reason applies to the second nation, even though it's all in the same verse. The Maharsha, one of the great commentaries on the Talmud, he disagrees based on the way the Talmud explains this whole episode and this, and this, this concept. And the Zer Shimshon chooses to go with this opinion and explain something very fascinating. Okay? He says, look at when the Moavim, the Moabites, came out with bread and water 40 years after, meaning 40 years after they needed it. They didn't come to give it. They actually came. Does anyone know what they came to do? They came to sell it. Oh, very good. Thank you very much. It's like buying a bottle of cold water at a gas station. $4.99. Or even worse, in an airport. Like, thank you. $6.99. $17.99. Okay, fine. Like, thank you very much. When you're in desperate need, so you go for it. You sometimes don't have a choice. But were they really doing something good something noble, a nice act by coming out and offering for sale. It's like when the kids go around and they sell the chocolates for, for their fundraising for school, and it's $5 for a little chocolate bar. By the way, you only get that at the Jewish schools. I, I heard one of, these, one of these public schools going around, and it's a dollar a bar. I wonder, why, I wonder why the Jewish schools are selling for $5 a bar. But anyways, <laughs> it's kosher. It's kosher. It's all, they're all kosher. Everything's Hershey. It's okay. It's all <laughs> So like, are they really doing you a favor? Was Moab really doing the Jewish people a favor? So you know what? The Zer Shimshon says they should have, if they really would have been noble, they would have come to give the bread and water to the Jewish people. That would be really good. That would show that they're really good people and really nice and they care about the Jews. Right? But they didn't. Rather, they came to charge big money for it. So my question to you, and this is the Zer Shimshon's question to all of us is, why would we ever think that they should be the ones to come up and offer food to the Jewish people? If I come to you, you know, you might like me, so you might give me a chocolate bar, whether it's worth a dollar or five, doesn't matter, you know? You might give me a drink, you might let me stay over for a night, but as we all know, Guests are like fish. They, they smell good, or they taste good for the first day, but then they start going rotten. So why does the Torah, or why is the Zer Shimshon, or the Marsha, any of these commentaries, saying that they should have come out? We're like expecting from the Moabites that they should have came out to give food and drink to the Jewish people. So look at where they come from. Does anyone know who Ammon and Moab were? The patriarchs, so to say, of, that, of, that, of those families? Anybody? Very good. From Lot. Lot was Abraham's nephew. Abraham's nephew is an interesting guy. Okay? We're not going to fully paint his picture this evening, but he was, or he decided to set up his life in Sin City. Not Las Vegas, Sedom. Okay? That's where he set himself to be. And because of that, he was a better person than the rest. He got himself into trouble, for, to make a long story short, for hosting angels. Okay? And he had to leave. He left with only two of his daughters. His wife turned to a pillar of salt. Pillar of salt. And they really thought on their way out that the world was literally coming to an end. So from the scripture we can understand Lot didn't really think that, but he played along as we'll soon see. But his two daughters literally thought that the world was coming to an end. It wasn't just Sedom that was destroyed the whole world. So what they did was the older one got, his, got her father drunk and had relations with her father with noble intentions because she thought the world was coming to an end and the only way to continue the world is to well he's the only male and we're the only two females that's how we're going to have more population so she comes over to her sister and says last night you know what happened and then she the next sister did the same thing the two children that came from those 
illicit relationships as we spoke about was Ammon and Moab. All of this to tell us, okay, that their descendants really owed a piece of gratitude, a thanks, an appreciation to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants because it was Abraham who ended up saving Lot from Sidom. He prayed to God for him. He sent him the angels. He took Lot back on his way back. He raised Lot. He, he, what's the word I'm looking for? He adopted him. He adopted Lot as a child after his father jumped into the furnace. Haran, right? Do you remember that story? Haran jumped into the furnace. Lot was a little kid. Abraham adopts him and he goes along with him. And for those reasons, we kind of are expecting the tribe of Moab to reciprocate and come back and offer food and drink. Yet they didn't. So the Zer Shimshon says, okay, so they owe him something? But you know how much food they would have to give the Jewish people? Does anyone know how many Jews were traveling at that time? A lot. A lot. How much? Two million. So, they, so the, this is the calculation. The calculation is there's 600,000 men million. between ages 20 and 60. That's 600,000 males only between that age. Okay? Add from 0 to 20. Add from 60 to 120. And then double that for the women. We get to an approximate 3 million. Wow. Okay? Let's put it that way. So now we are coming, as Hashem Shon is saying, and we're kind of obligating Moab to give 3 million Jews, not anybody, Jews worth of kosher food. That's a lot to ask from them. Why could we ever demand that from them? So we said, okay, so they owe gratitude, they owe appreciation for, their, for the patriarch who saved their patriarch, but still... So listen to this. This is how the Zer Shimshon explains that the second reason really is coming and also being there not only for Moab, but the first reason is also there for Moab. That Moab never really came and offered food and drink. Because what did Moab go on to do? What did they one time do? They hired Bil'am to curse the Jewish people. Do you, ha- never mind curse somebody that you love. Do you hire a professional cursor to curse someone you love? Why is no one raising their hand? Because we don't do that. No. You might hire a blesser to bless someone you love. Okay? You might light a candle for someone you love. But you're not going to hire a cursor to curse someone that you like. So it was clear the Zer Shimshon says that Moab did not like the Jewish people. They despised them. And you know what? They can never come and claim that they care so much about their money or that they didn't have any money because they offered Bil'am a house, as the Torah says, Melo beto kesef a house full of gold and silver. That's no pretty penny. That is a lot of money. And for that reason, the Zer Shimshon says, Moav is at fault not only for the second reason, but also for the first. Having said this, if we look at the other two nations, and this is going to shed light on what this all means to us, because like we said, nowadays, all converts are accepted if they're righteous converts. doesn't matter if they labeled as Ammon or Moav, or if they're labeled as Edom or, or Mitzri. So what does all this mean to us? So now let's look at the second two. Why is it that an Edomite is not allowed to be accepted as a convert right away? Well, who comes from Edom? Amalek. Amalek is one of the families, the offshoots of Edom. You know what they did when we left Egypt, the difference of opinion, either right after the splitting of the sea or right after the giving of the Torah. They came and they waged war against the Jewish people. How can you accept someone who wages war against you to be part of your family? So that's why they're not accepted. But why are they accepted at the third generation? How does that make it any different? Because we have 
a sense of appreciation for them, a sense of brotherly love. Look what the Torah says. The Torah tells us, I'll find you the verse. It says, Lo adomi. You know why? Why don't you reject him? Ki achichahu. He's your brother. How's he your brother? Because he is from the children of Esav. He's your cousin. He's your brother. Even if your brother, your cousin, your sister, any one of your family members wages war with you, it's this balance that we need to strike. They're not welcome right away, full force, like it was before. But at the end of the day, they're your sibling. They're your brother. There will come a time where trust will be built that you are able to welcome them back. Now let's look at the second, the Mitzrim. Why would it make sense for us, so this is an easier one, to not accept an Egyptian into our family? Well, to say the least, they took all of our baby boys and they threw them in the Nile. Is that not a good enough reason? Okay, what about all the torture and the bondage that we went through while living there? The discrimination? But why they accept it at the end? Look at this. Because at the end of the day, the Egyptian people took in the Jewish people when we had nowhere to go. When was this? This is when Jacob and his sons found themselves in a famine in the land of Canaan. And they had nowhere to go. Joseph said, come. Who really invited them? Yeah, Joseph was the messenger. It was Paro. The Egyptian people welcomed the Jewish people when they had nowhere to go. The Torah says, you know why? Because there was something in it for him. What? That for sure. But wait. <laughs> it says, Lo ta'ev mitzri. Why? Ki ger ha'ita be'artso. You were a refugee in his country. So again, it's a balance. It's not full force. Hello, you killed our, 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 our sons at the end of the day. You whipped us to work for you. But there will come a time where they can come back. Now look at how our commentaries draw the dichotomy between the first two and the second two. You know why the first two absolutely are not ever allowed to join us? It's because they lack the simple trait of love, kindness, and most importantly, gratitude. They lost the boat on gratitude. They should have expressed gratitude and come with food and not hired a cursor to curse us because we are really family. Yeah, it might be a couple generations ago, but we're really family. There's no room for a lack of love, compassion obviously, appreciation, kindness, and gratitude amongst the Jewish people. Dor Asiri, even the 10th generation, never is welcome. But these other two, these other two, we, can you imagine that God, can you, crazy story, can you imagine that your neighbor, Chas Shalom, killed one of your kids, yet your other kid or your other grandchild marries that person's kid or grandchild? How could it ever happen? If it was a mistake, it still wouldn't happen. But intentionally, how could, how could that ever cross one's mind? Ah, you know why it crosses the Torah's mind? Because we value gratitude and appreciation. We value, even though you slapped me, even though you killed me, but I still owe you a piece of gratitude. It's not today, it's not the next generation, the third generation is already allowed. This is one of the most tremendous lessons that we can learn as Jews. This is a Jewish trait. A Jewish trait is to be appreciative and to express gratitude. It doesn't cost anything to express gratitude. And it could be for something so grand, so important, where it's kind of expected, and something that's small. When a person lacks the trait of gratitude, it is one of the most repulsive and disgusting traits to have. No one wants to be around someone who's always taking and requesting and wanting without a thank you, without I appreciate it. And no one wants lip service. They want you to be genuine. They want you to really tell me why you're thanking me. Tell me why you couldn't live without me. Tell me why I couldn't get this done without you. And this is so true for marriage. And this is so true for siblings for friends, for neighbors, for parents, 
anybody at work, it really changes the whole tone when you start appreciating, when you start becoming grateful rather than an ingrate. Nobody, and remind yourself, no one wants to be around an ingrate. How do you feel when you do for your children and they don't thank you because they think it's supposed to be on autopilot? They think money grows on trees and gifts got to come every Rosh Chodesh and every Shabbat it's got to be full, full, full table, perfect, everything good. And they want, and they want their, and they want the new iPhone, what, iPhone 11? Where are we at, Ronit? Allah 11, okay? They want the iPhone 11. They want the bill paid. They want the extra fast one. They want, every, they want a car. Everything they want. And when they don't say thank you, how do you feel? You know, you might not say anything, but deep down, it doesn't feel good. You're giving up your life for them. You're doing for them. You're taking away from you to, to give them. And there's no thank you. That is a grand example. I'm not trying to make you think of your kids by me giving that whole I- idea <laughs> for that picture. I-, I missed that. I did already. Okay. But as p- children to a parent, that thank you is such a good investment. Even on a, on, a, on a transactional level, when you thank somebody, they want to do more for you. And by the way, if you thank them because you want them to do more for you, the recipient will know it. And that's not called genuine anymore. Whenever it comes to the traits of appreciation and gratitude, the truth is so easily readable on the other that you better mean it or don't say it at all. And this means so much when it comes to one spouse. When your spouse makes food, when your spouse brings you a gift, takes you somewhere, surprises you, thinks of you, if it's genuine, it means the world to the other. If it's fake, you better have not done it. It would have been better not even doing it. Okay? There is still a concept of fake it till you make it, but that's already on a rocky road. Okay? We, we don't want to be in such a situation. And even... Okay, let's just move on from that, because that's not where we want to be. Okay? We don't want to be there, but... We want to be a place where we do appreciate, where we do express gratitude. It gets you so much further in every area of your life. Look at how, f- how infinite the Torah and how specific it is with even the way it will accept a convert or not. All four of these nations are able to convert. Even the first two, Ammon and Moab. However, the ne- they'll always be con- la- labeled as converts. Okay? A, a convert who converts properly, as soon as they marry into or their children marry into the Jewish people, they've molded and melded in with us, and that's fine. If it's for the right intentions, we accept that. We don't missionize, we don't go promote it, but if someone genuine comes, it means that they have a spark from Adam, or from even later on, from more recent, that they're reconnecting to. But... Look at how we are able to discern these ones are fully, fully rotten because they're lacking that simple trait of love, kindness, appreciation, and gratitude opposed to the way we act to the ones who slapped us, killed us, waged war against us. This is the first lesson we're going to learn this evening and now we're moving on to the second which is in the same episode. Right after the Torah tells us that Ammon and Moab is not welcome because they hired Bilam, look at what the Torah reminds us that God did to us for the case of Bilam. I'm in chapter, again, 23, and I'm in verse 6. It says, Velo ava Hashem elokecha lishmoa el Bilam. And God, He refused to listen to Bilam. Vayahafoch Hashem Elokecha, and God changed Lechayet Aklala Libracha for you, the curses to blessings. Ki Ahevicha Hashem Elokecha, because God loves you. I'm going to put this, I'm going to say it now, and I'm going to say it at the end again. You need to know God loves you. As much as you think that your life is completely upside down and everyone's neighbor's grass always looks greener but God loves you and he tailor made whatever you're going through just for you no one else could be going through it 
Yeah, someone else might have the same problems, but at a different capacity, at a different time. Someone else could be going through those exact same things, but it's not exactly the same. You know why? Because God loves you. He knows what's a strong enough push to make you better and not too strong to, for you to crack. It's our test. It's all of our tests. But let's go back to this and we're going to get back to that. Okay? Because you know what God did? He loves you so much. He took the curses that Bilam sent to us. And as we learned a couple months ago, he turned them into blessings. Comes the Talmud. The Talmud tells us, you know where Bilam's power lied? Bilam knew the exact millisecond every day that God got angry. The Talmud tells us that there's a millisecond somewhere in the middle of the night where God gets in his realm, kivyachol, as if angry. And Bilam was the only human being, even Moses didn't know this, exact precise time. He knew when that moment was, and what he was trying to do was he was planning to curse the Jewish people at that moment. Okay? You know what Talmud says God did because he loves us so much? During this whole episode of Bilam trying to curse us, he didn't get angry. There wasn't even that millisecond of anger. It's like Bilam every night was waiting up, okay, three, two, one. It's not happening. So King Balak's like, what's wrong with you? It's not happening. And he blessed the Jewish people. Okay, let's try it tomorrow night. Three, two, count down. It's not happening. And this was God's tremendous mercy and blessing towards the Jewish people. So now that Bilam had no ammo, the Zerashim Shon says, because he didn't have that moment when God was angry, what does it mean? Was the Torah telling us that God changed His curses into blessings? He never cursed us. The words that came out of His mouth was a blessing. And what are we thanking God for switching it when He actually took away all of His ammo and His powers from the get-go, being that He doesn't get angry? This is Zerashim Shon's question. Good question? It's a valid question. Listen to his answer. This, ta- this piece of Talmud we mentioned last week. So those of you who were here, bear with me, I'll say it quick. And those of you who weren't, well, you'll get to hear it. The Talmud is quoting the very famous verse of En Od Milivado. En Od Milivado means there is no one else except for Him. Capital H, which means God. And this is something that we live by and understand that everything that happens in our life or any way that we will find a salvation, it's always Ein od milivado. There is no one else except for him. He's the one who puts us in these tests. He's the one that's going to take us out of these tests. He's the one who aided in us being born. Right? We know the Talmud says there's three partners in creation: father, mother, and God. And if God wasn't there, well, there would be no soul. There would be no nothing at that moment. God created the world. He created us. He brought us to where we are today. So we believe that he will be the only one that will help us continue. Based on this, showing that he's the only power, Rabbi Hanina, that was his name, great Talmudic sage, was of the opinion that even witchcraft and sorcery could have absolutely no effect on him. Because he lives by the concept of Ein od milavado. There is no one else except for capital H, him. Okay? There was even a witch who came and took some dust from under the feet of Rabbi Hanina and he looked back at her, the Talmud says, and says, and he told her, do what you want with it because your magic and your witchcraft will have absolutely no effect on me. It's like, go for it. Now there's another Rabbi, Rabbi Yochanan, who said that, on the contrary, the word in Hebrew for Michashefim, Kishuf, actually is an acronym for that there's so much power to witchcraft that it even has the power to alter destiny in the realms of heaven. So the Talmud is at, at a debate. Well, which one is it? Is it that witchcraft is not strong enough to change the will of God? Or is witchcraft even strong enough to alter and change the will of God? The Talmud says, a person that has only merit, such as Rabbi Hanina, is above all witchcraft and magic. But for regular people, and apparently Rabbi Yochanan, who by the way in his own right was a tremendous individual, 
it did have some type of effect on him. So we know where we all stand, obviously. Okay. Based on this, the Zer Shimshon says, you know what Bil'am was trying to do? He was trying to cover all of his bases. He first wanted to see, will the Jewish people, him and Balak, like they consulted, will the Jewish people ever sin in the future? They said, most probably, okay? So let's curse them today, and let's arouse God's anger for them, for the evil that they will commit in the future. But now what happens if they don't commit any evil? That's when the Zeshim Shon says that they sprinkled in a little bit, a dosage of of magic and of witchcraft to even if they're not deserving of the curse that maybe this will boost it up and now come and curse them. Based on that the Zer Shimshon says this answers how God really changed it because if God would have been according to the letter of the law for us yeah of course you think the Jewish people didn't do anything wrong from then on? Of course they did. God took what could have been a potential curse that Bilam could have potentially cursed the Jewish people for something wrong they would have done in the future and turned that even into a blessing. That's how much God loves you, the Torah is telling us. The Zer Shimshon says, God loves you so much, he's going above and above the letter of the law to not allow any curse. Now, now Bilam was scared. King Solomon said, anyone who curses someone for no reason, the curse goes right back on them. So Bilam was scared to curse. He already was coming with a a twisted tongue. Like he wanted to curse, but he was scared to curse. And so he said, you know what? I'm going to do my curse even though it's against my will, but I'm going to put some magic and some witchcraft in there. That's how God, really out of his tremendous love for us, spared us from those potential curses and really changed it to a blessing. Now, the Zer Shimshon focuses on one word of this, on this verse, and I think this word is going to change everything in perspective for us. Look at the word over here. I'm going to quote the verse to you again. And it's in chapter 23, verse 6. It says, And God refused to listen to Bil'am, and He changed. Listen to these words. Vayafoch Hashem Elokecha. And God, your God, your Master, He changed. Lecha et haklala. For you, the blessing... The, 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 for you, the curse into a blessing. The Zeshim Shon says the word lecha for you is superfluous. It's obvious. Who else is he changing the curse into a blessing for? If Bilam's coming to curse us and it comes out as a blessing, so who's the blessing going to? Well, to us. Well, not so simple. God tells Abraham, this is back in Genesis. God tells Abraham the following. I'm quoting it to you. This is in Genesis. Let me find it. Genesis chapter 27, verse 29. Listen to the following. It says, Orerecha arur umvarechecha baruch. Those who will curse you will be cursed, and those who will bless you will be blessed. Okay? Comes this situation over here, and Bilam is coming to curse the Jewish people. What are the words that come out of his mouth? A blessing. So according to this, what should happen? Well, he should be blessed back himself, right? Because anyone who blesses a descendant of Abraham is blessed back. However, God says not so. There's a Jerusalem Talmud. I think I spoke about this once. The main Talmud we learn is the Babylonian Talmud. There's also a Jerusalem Talmud. The Jerusalem Talmud tells us that there's a primary difference between the way God operates with Jews and Gentiles. It's kind of unfair in our favor, but again, we are the chosen people, and that comes with responsibility and a lot to do. But there are perks and there are benefits as well. Listen to what the Jerusalem Talmud says about the way God operates with Jews. That when a Jew has an intention to do something good, And out of their will, they didn't get it done. Guess what? They get the merit for it. And if a Jew has the intention to do something bad, something horrible, and whether with their will or against their will, they don't end up doing it, they're not punished for it. Okay? For example, a person had the intention to 
I don't know, get up early enough in the morning to go pray or to go to slichot or with the intention to make a certain amount of money so they could give 10% to charity. Okay? They had the real, real intention to do so. And whatever it was out of their will that did not happen, they still get the merit for it. Look how amazing that is. And a person who had the intention to steal, to kill, to lie, to do something horrible, and it was out of their hands, and you go back to them and say, would you still want to do it? They'd say, yes, I really wish I could do it. Until they did it, they're not punished for it. It's amazing, huh? God loves us so much, as we just said. Look at how God operates with the Gentiles, the Jerusalem Talmud says. That a Gentile who has the intention to do something good gets no merit for it until it was done. I'm about to tell us one of the grandest secrets of Judaism. If a Gentile has the intention to do something bad and it wasn't done, they get the, they get the opposite of the reward, the punishment as if it was done. Exact opposite of a Jew. It's not fair. But this is the difference and the definition of what God is seeking from each and every one of His children, specifically His Jews. All He wants is our effort. If He sees you put in effort to do something good and you didn't do it, well, He understands that. Because as Human beings, we don't really care about effort. Do you care? I mean, we should. But at the end of the day, do you care how hard or how long your child studied for the test if they came home with a 25? You don't care. There's no excuse in the world unless every other kid got it and then they're crying and they're pulling that card, which probably isn't true. But anyways, okay? But you don't care about that. At the end of the day, your bank account, your banker, your business, your employer, your employer, doesn't matter how hard you try to make money, if the money doesn't come in, well then your bills aren't getting paid. And your employees aren't getting paid. We don't care about effort in the finite world that we live in. God is so different than that. And that's, by the way, how you transition into a great Jew, into a great child of God, and to a great parent for your children. When you start appreciating the effort put into something, when you start understanding that that's all God cares about from you, is your effort. He knows that you cannot do all 613 mitzvot. Well, you're not a man and a woman at the same time, I hope, and you're not a Kohen or a Levi, all at the same time, and in Israel, and you're not living in the land of Israel, and you're not a king, so you can't be everything at once. It's a collective group effort. But more than that, even the ones that you are obligated to do, do you think God really, really expects you to do every single one? The answer is yes. He expects you to try your hardest, your, and you can't fool God, to try your hardest for every single one. And He'll judge you, and He will bless you and reward you based on those efforts. He knows your struggles. He knows your hardships. He knows what you can and cannot do. All He cares about is how hard you try. So going back to this, you know why the Torah adds in Lecha? You know why Lecha? Because you think we're going to give merit to that good for nothing Bil'am for trying to curse the Jewish people. It came, he intended to curse and it came out as a blessing. Oh, does he get the blessing back? Is that Mevarechecha Baruch? Those who bless you will be blessed? No! He didn't intend to bless you. He's a Gentile, a Gentile who intended to do something wrong. Even though he didn't do the wrong thing, he's still punished for it. And that's why the Torah, the Zer Shimshon says, was super specific in saying that Vayafoch Hashem Lokecha, God changed Lecha, only for the Jewish people, was those curses turned into a blessing. But those curses bounced right back on Bil'am. This verse, and especially those last words of Ki Ahavicha Hashem Lokecha, that Hashem loves you so much, literally must become the motto of our life. When you live in a idea in a concept and you're really living the idea that your parents love you your parents here in this world 
that automatically infuses a certain element of confidence in you. You feel like you could take that test, like you could get that job, like you could win that sport or that competition or, or buy or build or make or sell anything you want when you have that confidence. As Jews, we have to know, we have to live with that confidence that we know that our Father in Heaven loves us just like and if not many times more than when a parent loves their children. That should infuse a sense of confidence, a sense of emunah and bitachon, belief and trust in God that we can do anything we really set our minds to do because we know we got a Father in Heaven that loves us that will push us along. It's like any parent that we have nowadays. A parent that loves the child, the child feels it. If a parent knows, sorry, if a child knows that a parent will and has given up for them, now they are ready to take life's challenges. Again, it's a balance of not spoiling them too much that they don't know how to do anything, yet infusing them with confidence and inspiration and, and the willingness to want to actually do great things in their lives and fulfill their purpose. So to go back to the lesson of the first lesson that we learned this, this evening is the concept of gratitude. Gratitude has to be running through our veins. As a Jew, it is part of our makeup of our very own DNA. And we have to live that way. It's not good enough that you have a Jewish last name and a Jewish first name and a Jewish nose and you eat Jewish food. That's not good enough. We need to live like a Jew. We need to live like God's children, like God's son or God's daughter and treat all those around as such. And the second lesson is knowing that God loves you. And when you know that God loves you, that He will judge you favorably, that He will give you your merit and your reward on your intentions, and He won't punish you on wrong intentions, all of that love should infuse us with a tremendous amount of confidence to want to take life with its challenges, with its sweetness, great stuff, and bitter and hard stuff all at the same time, and grow from all those experiences and be the best Jew, the best human being, the best family member that we could ever possibly be. Thank you everyone for coming and hope to see you again soon.